Well, you know what they say, there ain't nothing quite like a Daniel Day-Lewis movie, and for the first time on the channel today, we're gonna cover one, as we review at the Channel Points Request of Rez, In the Name of the Father, which was released in 1993. In the Name of the Father is a biographical film co-written and directed by Jim Sheridan, who also did two other films of Daniel Day-Lewis, My Left Foot and The Boxer. This film is based off the true story of the Guildford Four, who were four people falsely accused in 1974 of a pub bombing in Guildford which killed four off-duty British soldiers and a civilian. The framed ringleader was Jerry Conlon, who Daniel Day-Lewis plays in the film. And the screenplay for this film was adapted from his book, Prove Innocent, which he released in 1990. In addition to Lewis, this film also contained performances from Emma Thompson, Pete Polliswaite, John Lynch, and Corin Redgrave. The film received overwhelmingly positive reviews from critics and was decently underrated at the box office. On a budget of 13 million, it made about 66 million back. The film was also the second highest grossing film ever in Ireland, just behind Jurassic Park, interestingly enough. It was not underrated in terms of awards, however, as it received seven Oscar nominations. And as he usually does, Daniel Day-Lewis was very committed to this role. He lost over 50 pounds to prepare for it, and to gain an insight into Conlon's thoughts and feelings at the time, he spent three days and nights in a jail cell, and was prevented from sleeping by a group of thugs who would bang on his door every ten minutes to wake him up. He also insisted the crew members of the film to throw cold water on him and verbally abuse him at all points, and he kept his Belfast accent on at all times as well. So all this sounds like it resulted in a hell of a film, but what exactly went down in it? Well, we're going to find out right now as we review In the Name of the Father, released in 1993. So our film begins with a bang, literally, as on October 5th, 1974, a pub in Guildford, England blows up. We then flash back a couple months and in Belfast, Northern Ireland, Jerry Conlon and a few friends are salvaging some scrap from rooftops. However, British security forces occupying the city mistake him for an IRA sniper and give chase to him. This results in one giant ass riot between the security forces and the Irish. Jerry is then about to be shot by a member of the IRA who previously warned him from salvaging scrap until he's saved by his father Giuseppe. Giuseppe then decides that the best thing for Jerry is to get him out of Belfast and sends him on a boat to London. While on the boat, he reunites with an old friend from school named Paul Hill. Upon arriving in London, they join a hippie commune which includes his good friend Patty Armstrong and a woman named Carol Richardson. Things go well for about six weeks with the commune until the other members start to turn on them for being Irish as there's been more bombings in the area as of recent. That night, Jerry and Paul hang out in the park with an Irish homeless man named Charlie Burke. And while they're in the park, that's when that pub in Guildford explodes. While they're walking down the street, they notice a prostitute dropped her wallet, which contains the keys to her house. Upon entering, Jerry finds $700 in cash and robs her. Jerry then buys all new flashy clothes and goes back to Belfast and gives the rest of his money to his family. Good times don't last for long, however, as that night their house is raided and Jerry is arrested by the British Army. He's held under suspicion of terrorism and a new recently passed act shows that they can hold him for seven days. During that time, he's severely beaten, tortured, and has his mind broken by the army, who are trying to accuse him of those pub bombings. During all this, Paul, Patty, and Carol are also brought in and interrogated as well. Giuseppe, meanwhile, had gone to London to stay with his sister-in-law, Anne McGuire, and her family, which proves not to be such a good idea, as their house gets raided and they're promptly arrested. A detective Pavis is finally able to break Jerry as he threatens to kill Jerry's dad and the rest of his family. And as a result of this, Jerry as well as Paul sign statements confessing to the crimes. Carol and Patty were coerced into statements as well, and the now branded Guilford Four are split up and sent to different prisons. And upon arriving at prison, Jerry is put into a cell with Giuseppe. The trial begins for the Guilford Four as well as the Maguire Seven as they're branded, who are accused of helping them make the bombs. Despite there being not so good evidence, the fix is clearly already in, and they're all found guilty. The four are all given at least 30 years, but Jerry is branded the ringleader and is given life. And Maguire as well as Giuseppe are both given 15 years. Jerry and Giuseppe pretty much have to keep to themselves in prison as everyone else kind of wants to kill them, except for some nice Jamaican guys who give Jerry some acid. 
Meanwhile, an IRA leader named Jill McAndrew is arrested on multiple crimes and also confesses to being the one behind the Guilford bombings. He just so happens to be brought to the same prison as Giuseppe and Jerry, where he quickly acquaints himself with the other inmates. He then tells Jerry and Giuseppe that he was the one responsible and that he told the police, but they're probably not going to do anything with it. And yeah, he was right, they're not going to do anything with it. Jerry then essentially becomes Joe's right-hand man in prison and life becomes a lot better for him, while Giuseppe stays away from him as he doesn't want anything to do with Joe, considering he's a murderer. Jerry and Joe then pretty much unify the prison and go about getting the attention of the Chief P.O. Barker as they stage a protest to try to prove Jerry's innocence. Eventually, a riot squad is called in, though, and they're all beaten pretty badly, including Giuseppe. Giuseppe then meets and makes friends with Gareth Pierce, a lawyer who wants to prove his innocence. Jerry's not too keen on her though as he doesn't like attorneys or, you know, English people. Hopefully she can work fast to get them out, however, as Giuseppe's health is starting to rapidly decline. One night, while they're watching a movie screening of The Godfather, Joe decides to get his revenge on Barker for the riot squad being called in and fucking sets him on fire. After that, Jerry cuts ties with Joe, but it doesn't really matter as Joe has moved to another prison. Jerry then decides to join up the cause with Giuseppe and Gareth and makes a tape of his entire experience. Things are not going too well for Gareth though as she's constantly boxed out by the Chief Inspector Robert Dixon who's responsible for putting the four in prison in the first place. And unfortunately later that night in prison Giuseppe stops breathing and passes away in a hospital. Gareth and Jerry continue their campaign together and even get the public on their side demanding for his release. In an attempt to further stall their communication, Jerry is transferred to a prison in Scotland. One night when Gareth is receiving documents, she accidentally sneezes on one when she hands it back to the man who usually gives it to her. Why is that significant? Well, because the next day there's a new person there who doesn't know that they're not supposed to give her certain documents, and she ends up getting all the case documents on Jerry, which she never got before. And this file happens to contain all the evidence they need to spring the four free, including an interview with Charlie Burke, who the prosecution previously said did not exist, as well as the confessions from the actual IRA members who actually did the bombing. This is enough to get them a retrial, and upon presenting this evidence, the four are all acquitted 15 years after being sentenced. Jerry leaves for the front door and tells the media that he'll spend the rest of his life campaigning to get his father Giuseppe's name cleared. We are then left with his epilogue. Jerry Conlon lives in London. Upon his release from prison, he, along with Gareth Pierce and Sarah Conlon, campaigned to clear Giuseppe Conlon's name. Patty Armstrong returned to Ireland. Presently, he lives in Dublin. Carol Richardson lives in England. She is married with one child. Paul Hill recently married Courtney Kennedy, daughter of Robert Kennedy. They live together in New York. In addition, a government inquiry was ordered into the convictions of Giuseppe Conlon and the McGuire family. The inquiry discovered evidence affecting the reliability and credibility of the prosecution, forensic scientists, and determined that on that basis alone, the Court of Appeal conviction should be overturned. However, the IRA men who admitted they were responsible for the Guilford pub bombing have never been charged with the offense and they remain in British prisons to this day. The three ex-detectives were acquitted of conspiracy to prevent the course of justice after their trial on May 19, 1993. No policeman has ever been convicted of any crime in this case, and Giuseppe Conlon is buried in Milltown Cemetery, Belfast. So when there's a film like this based off a true story, the number one thing you might want to know is, how accurate was it? Well, it was mostly accurate, but there were some inaccuracies. It didn't seem to be anything major, just the fact that Giuseppe and Jerry were not kept in the same prison in reality, and also Gareth Pierce did not actually represent Giuseppe. Jim Sheridan said about these choices in 2003, I was accused of lying in the name of the father, but the real lie was saying it was a film about the Guildford Four, when in reality it was a film about a non-violent parent. Basically justifying those changes by saying that the film was more about the relationship between Giuseppe and Jerry, which, you know, fair enough. I will admit going into this review, this is the first time I had ever seen this film, and I thought it was tremendous, although I'm not necessarily surprised, as I've never seen a bad Daniel Day-Lewis movie. And while I had never heard of this story before, it reminds me a lot of the Central Park Five, who were five black men falsely accused of rape in Central Park, New York in the 90s and held in prison for 20 years before it was found that they didn't do it. And unfortunately, this film is a very cold reality. People in power can basically get away with whatever they want. As stated at the end there, nobody was charged with this, even though they knew that they were innocent. They were never charged, 
They were never convicted. Maybe they were charged, but they were never convicted. Nothing ever happened to them. And unfortunately, a lot of times, nothing ever does. Sometimes it does. Sometimes something will slip for the crack and they throw a scapegoat out there. But most of the times, people in power protect the fellow people in power, even if it's not the right thing to do, which is fucked up. But that's the reality of how it is. And this film, of course, is also a stern reminder to always look at the reality of the situation and the facts and not to act on emotion. It's hard to do that, though, because, I mean, emotion is human nature. But, I mean, sometimes you got to look at things objectively, even if people, even if the majority are like, oh, well, you know, he was guilty, he's guilty. Even if you're going to look down on it for not acting on emotion, you got to stick with what's right, because, again, that's how shit like this happens. But this was a fantastic film and probably one of the best things I've ever reviewed on the channel. And if you haven't seen it before, I'd recommend checking it out for yourself. But that's going to do it for my review of In the Name of the Father. Thank you again to Rez for using your channel points on this. Next week on the channel, we'll be back with a classic horror film, Carnival of Souls. But that's going to do it for me today. Thank you guys for watching. If you liked the video, be sure to leave it a like. If you want to follow any of my social media links, they're all in the description down below, including my Patreon. Thank you to all my Patrons named in the description for your con support of me and my channels. I appreciate you guys. With all that being said, though, my name is Noah Taff. This has been my review of In the Name of the Father, released in 1993. And I'll see you guys next time. Bye.